I just got a packet from Ada Fruit, and look what one of the items was. I wanted to play around with uh, one of these uh, little tiny software-defined radios. This little guy plugs into your computer. Uh, it's got an antenna, and uh, there's a little CD-ROM in here. This will listen to a lot of the radio spectrum, and there's some parts of it that are related to amateur radio. I hope we get a chance to listen to. So it'd be fun experimenting with that. So stick around. We'll see what we do with these guys. This video is divided into three sections. The first one is a tutorial. It's a walkthrough of me actually setting up the software and the drivers and getting the dongle up and running. I've done a lot of editing, trimmed out all the delays while we wait for software to load and drivers to install. So you can follow along, but you'll want to pause as you do your own. The second section is a quick demo of the SDR Sharp software. If you're not interested in how we install it and get it running, you can skip ahead to this time frame and see what software defined radio is and how it works. The final section is a treat. If you stick your head out the window and look up in the sky, chances are you'll see airplanes flying. Most of them are sending digital data. I'll show you that with a simple dongle, you can collect and view that data right on your own computer. Scrub ahead to this time frame here to see how we eavesdrop on the planes in the sky. Skip ahead or stick around. Let's have some fun with the DBB T-Stick from Adafruit. Let's take a look at this web page where Adafruit describes this little software-defined radio. You can see here with a quarter on the page how small it is. We got a few other pictures. This is where the antenna plugs in, and uh, it's all quite tiny. And then in their description, they tell us to uh, go to various websites to get the information that that we need to get this up and running. So let's go over to this first one and click the link. The first thing that Zadig tells us is that when we plug in the little dongle, first thing we might see is that it's going to want to install a driver. And it says go ahead and do that because we're going to remove and reinstall a new driver anyway later so it won't matter. Let's plug it in and see what happens here. Okay, we'll plug it in. We hear the beep. No messages about drivers. Let's see what's next. Now it tells us to download the latest version of Zadig. Let's click here. When you get to the Zadig page Look at the page carefully. You'll see a great big green download button here. Don't click that one. That's a scam. It's an ad. It's going to take you to some other uh, product completely. But if you scroll down, you'll see down here where you can choose which operating system you have. I'm running Windows 7, so we'll click right here where it says Windows Vista or later. We'll click Save File. It's in our download batch. We'll come over here and we will run that and we will run it. I guess we'll let it look for updates. Okay, here's the window that uh, they told us we would see. Now the online directions say go into the options menu and select all devices. Next, we expand this drop down menu and select bulk in interface zero. In the box to the right of the green arrow, we want to make sure 
that it says win USB and not uh, any of the other choices. We're told that we're supposed to make sure that the USB ID matches the VID slash PID in a hardware table. If we look at that table, we'll see that the first item in the list here refers to a generic RTL 2832U. Now, that's the one that I'm going to try first with the dongle that I have here because it's the most likely to be correct. Not only that, the ID that you see here is also the ID that we have at this location already on the screen. So we'll click replace driver. Replacing the driver was a little bit frustrating. I don't actually have video showing what all happened. But uh, you do see a message saying that it could take a long time, as much as five minutes. A full five minutes went by and it timed out. So uh, in the end, I ended up trying a second time. The second time, it went quite quickly. So hopefully you won't have too much difficulty doing it yourself. The next step is to download and unzip SDR install. Let's do that now. We'll say OK. Here's our program. And we'll unzip it. Extracting that file gives us this folder, SDR install. We look inside. We'll see that we've got an install.batch file in here. Let's extract all of these files. And we'll open the folder. And we're supposed to run um, install.bat. Let's open the command window. We've got a little batch file running here. Once you've unzipped those files, search for a folder called SDR Sharp and open it. You'll find a lot of files in there. Our directions tell us to launch this program called SDRSharp.exe. Let's give that a try. Well, it looks like we've got something up and running. Let's see what's next. Before we move on, let's um, hook up this little antenna that comes with the, uh, the software-defined radio uh, dongle. It, it, this isn't really much of an antenna. It, it, a lot of the things that I've read online say to get rid of it and hook up an external antenna outside, which uh, I think I'll be able to do. But for now, I'm just going to plug this one in and see what we get. Like that. And we'll place the antenna somewhere out of the way. I put a little loop of tape on the bottom of this stand. It, it really doesn't want to stand up by itself, but that should help. We'll just park it right here for now. Well, I've had an opportunity now to get SDR Sharp up and running and experiment uh, with it. There's a little bit of a learning curve. And, Part of the problem that I had is that the online support, the tutorials and things that I could find on the internet are a little behind uh, in terms of the version 
that uh, you download now. So many of the things that they're telling you to do don't even appear on the screen. But I've uh, spent some time with it and figured most of it out. I don't know that I understand all of it, but I, I am having some fun and I'm making it work. One of the things that uh, you'll need to know when you start the program up the first time is that it will default to um, a setting here, Other, Sound Card. And if you attempt to play, uh, you get error messages. And you may find that you have trouble setting frequencies. It took me a while to learn that I needed to change this. And in fact, the line that you want is RTL-SDR slash USB. So you want to select that. We'll give it a chance. Now, because I have been playing around, uh, this frequency comes up here. This is in the FM broadcast band. I've been messing around it. It's a good place to start um, because you're most likely going to find stations there, strong stations, that you should be able to copy even with that little 4-inch antenna. Because we're in the FM band, I have set this down here as wideband FM. That's the setting you you want for for FM stations. Let's uh, click play and uh, you should see some waterfalls come on the screen. These bright spots that you see over here are actually FM stations. I can slide over and double click on one and we'll probably hear something. I'll switch over to this one. So it's picking up stations pretty good here. You can change the frequency by dragging this uh, graphic display here. Let's uh, move it uh, down here a little ways. Here's some interference at the lower end of the band. You see these items showing up on the uh, waterfall. Let's let's go the other direction. Of course, when you see a bump like that, that is a FM station. Let's let's see what's going on here. Okay, we were there before. Let's move some more. I try this one in here. It's kind of a weaker station. You can adjust the contrast by sliding this slider up a little bit here. And then give you an idea of maybe where some stations are. If, if your stations are weaker, you can find them maybe by doing that. Just double click on some noise on the screen and you might hear something. Let's uh, do some more searching. Oh, we're getting a There's something over here. Let's try this one. Now, I can adjust these numbers individually up here. This should be, I'm going to assume, 101.1. If I right-click on this number, it'll clear everything else out to zeros. And it did bring the station in a little better when we get the right frequency. Let's try another one. Oh, it's in here. Somebody's in here. 104. Should we Is there a take it up to... No. Is there a not 104 point? No. Yeah, 104.1. Service fees? No. Here's a weak one over here. In your corner credit card. Industrial credit union uh, let's take that up a little bit, too. one oh four point nine maybe so one of the things that we can do let me turn this audio down a little bit one of the things that you can do is uh, find frequencies that you like and you can bookmark them and down here I have a, a set of frequencies that I've bookmarked and so if I want to go to for example KISM I can double click it we'll see it over here on the screen uh, and I will um, in uh, put the volume back up and you should be able to hear it. I think it's got to scroll to get back to that. Hang on.
And then over here. And I'm not staying on any frequency for any length of time because I am concerned about copyrights and whatnot. I'll double click this one down here and go to 106.5. Now, some of these stations include this uh, graphic display of data. It'll tell you what's playing. Uh, uh, if we go uh, to 104. That's a weaker station there. Here's a Canadian station. I I live on the Canadian border, so we get a a, a lot of Canadian stations here. And uh, well, it gives you a little bit of idea of what we can do with the um, that regular broadcast band. Of course, there's a huge spectrum out there. A lot of things that we can tune in. A lot of things that we can listen to. We'll have some more fun with us. Stick around. So we see how this works on the broadcast band. I decided to experiment and give it a try on uh, amateur radio frequency. So I got out my uh, 220 uh, handheld here and I decided to uh, bring up a repeater and see if I could hear it on this software defined radio. And I gave my buddy Peter a call. And then it occurred to me, well, why not record uh, part of that call? Take a look at Peter and I talking. Uh, I turned the volume down on the handheld and I'm actually listening to him come back to me on SDR radio. While I have this screen capture pause, let me tell you a little bit about the repeater. There's a mountain on an island across the water from me, and on top of it, there is a 400-foot tower. At, near the top of that tower, there's an antenna attached to our 220 repeater. Repeaters use two frequencies. The one you see here on the screen, 224.48 megahertz, is the frequency that the repeater is transmitting on. It's the frequency that we listen to. When we transmit though, we transmit on another frequency. That frequency is 600 kilohertz lower than this one. When you see me transmit in this video, you'll see some bright yellow and red along the left hand edge of this screen. That's actually my transmitter. You only see the edges of that signal because it's off the screen. I didn't have the repeater centered. Peter is located about 120 miles south of me. On 220 megahertz, we can't hear each other, but we can both hear the repeater on the mountain, and the repeater on the mountain can hear both of us. So by rebroadcasting our signals at the same time it hears us, we can hear each other. There's a third ham radio operator in our conversation. That's Jim, and he's located out on the San Juan Islands. When this recording starts, Peter is speaking and he's letting me know that when I spoke last, Jim and I happened to speak at the same time. He was able to hear Jim, but not me. Let's listen now to the conversation. The audio level's a bit low because I had the system sound set uh, a little lower than it should be for these recordings. But I think you'll be able to hear them if you listen carefully. Yeah, I think he, he's run off on that. Um, that's okay. Um, I think I've got a lot of background noise coming through my earphones here as I talk on my transmitter. But um, the uh, I do think this is going to work with a Raspberry Pi. Uh, it should be able to plug right into it, and I'm kind of curious about using it with that uh, Pi TNC, see what I might be able to pick up on APRS. Have I got it now? Well, that sounds great, Peter. Um, we'll we'll look into that, and um, 
I will sign off here. I've got to get ready to go to the radio club tonight. But I think I might take this uh, laptop and the dongle with me and see if I can make it play on the table there. Yeah, that was, she's a character, uh, really. Okay, I'm going to run, Peter. Talk to you later. WB7FHC. It's clear. Well, that's just a couple of examples of some of the things that you can do with the little SDR dongle for <laughs> less than 20 bucks. Those are all audio examples. There's digital things we can do, too. Let's look to the skies and find out what they are. If you plug secondary surveillance radar into a search engine, you can find this uh, Wikipedia page. And it's got some interesting information on it. Here's a radar antenna, probably at an airport. And what secondary surveillance radar is all about is that air traffic controllers can ping airplanes in the sky. And those airplanes have transponders on them that will send back a digital signal that contains data about their flight. Typically this data will include the call letters of the airplane, the uh, speed of the airplane, the altitude of the airplane, and sometimes it includes the latitude and longitude. An inexpensive SDR radio dongle, like the one I just got from Adafruit, will allow you to intercept and decode the signals from the airplanes that are flying over your head. It's really easy to do. Here's an example. I downloaded a free piece of software from SDR Sharp. This software called ADSB Sharp is a real simple little program. It just brings up this little screen here. It'll talk to that dongle. All I had to do was click the start button. I also found some software on the internet, this one called ADSB Scope, that takes the data that we're collecting from those radio transponders on the airplanes and displays it on the screen. If the airplane is sending the latitude and longitude, it shows the actual airplane on the map. Now there's several programs that will do this. This just happened to be the first one I found. Some of them are pretty fancy and use other utilities like Google Maps to give you real cool displays. The right hand section of this screen is divided into three parts and these are actually showing the digital data that's being transmitted from airplanes that are flying right over my head. We're picking up the data on the little four inch antenna. The left hand side of the screen is showing a map of the Pacific Northwest, right where I live. Two of those planes that are sending data that I can receive are also transmitting their latitude and longitude, so they're being displayed graphically on that map. Look at the data displayed next to this airplane here. It includes the registration or call letters of that airplane, November 779. Foxtrot Echo. It looks like this plane may have just taken off from Orcas Island out in the San Juan Islands. Let's have some fun with this. Watch what we can do. I'll put that registration number into the search engine. Let's see what comes up. November 7, 7, 9, Foxtrot Echo. Let's see what we get. Several pages seem to know about this aircraft. Let's try this one over here, Jet Photos, see what happens here. It says here that it's a Cessna 208B Super Cargo Master. You know, that map said that it was a C-208 also. Let's take a closer look. Look at there. I think it's our buddies over at FedEx delivering packages out to the San Juan Islands. In only a half hour, we barely scratched the surface of some of the things that you could do with a dongle such as this. Software-defined radio is pretty exciting, and it's an interesting hobby that you might want to give yourself a try. I've listened in on 
utility workers. I could hear the garbage guys uh, talking from their trucks. You could listen into the sheriff's department, see what's going on there. School buses. There's all kinds of radio signals out there. And it's okay to listen to them. It is against the law to listen to cellular phone calls. But nowadays, those are almost all digital. And you're not going to hear those with one of these little plug-in dongles. So I think you'll be okay. Give it a try. And hey, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share.